Hey friends, this is Chuck Marone. I want to talk just briefly today about interest rates. Interest rates are in the news going up. It's a lot of people talking about uh, why the Federal Reserve is meeting. Will they raise interest rates? Will they not raise interest rates? Interest rates are, in their essence, the supply demand of money. Uh, Tomas Sedlicek, the Czechoslovakian economist that I'm so fond of, uh, described interest rates as the way we time travel money, the way we bring money from the future into today and in a sense compensate ourselves over time for that time travel. When we look at interest rates as the supply and demand equilibrium of money, interest rates set where uh, the, the, the level of interest rates suggest what the demand and the supply of money is. If there's lots of people with cash sitting around and they want to lend it out, they want to put it to productive use, but there's not many people who have good ideas or productive things to do with that money, what you will see is that interest rates will go down, right? There's a lot of money and very few people asking for that money. And so the person willing to, in a sense, loan it out at the lowest rate is going to be the one that makes the loan. Interest rates will naturally come down. If you have the converse, if you have uh, not many people willing to lend money, if you have people holding on to their cash for whatever reason, or not willing to lend it out, um, you know, we don't have much savings, our savings is spread very thin, what have you. And you have lots of people who want to borrow money, lots of people who want to access that money. Um, you have the opposite effect, right? Um, these few people who have money to lend can charge a very high rate because there's so few of them compared to all the people that want money. As very essence, what we should see in a functioning economy is that when capital is scarce, interest rates should go up. And when capital is free flowing, um, interest rates should go down. If we look over the last couple of decades, um, what we have seen is that as we have gotten into economic turmoil, economic difficulty, um, the dot-com bust, 9-11 uh, fallout, the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war, uh, the housing crisis, the kind of echo of the housing crisis, the pandemic. What we have done in each of these instances is we have flooded the market with liquidity. We have put more and more money into the market. We've used that money to buy up all kinds of debt instruments. Anybody who wanted to borrow money for any reason, we would buy up that money with, in a sense, printed dollars um, in order to keep interest rates down. Um, that seems to be ending and ending for a whole bunch of reasons, um, which I think are very logical and actually probably long, long overdue. Um, the impact of this, however, is that those rates keep creeping up and up and up. And we see projects that were viable at 1% interest, 2% interest, not be viable at 5%, 6%, 8%. We also have this specter kind of hanging over us that, you know, during the uh, low interest rate times, uh, we loaded up on debt. Our corporations loaded up on debt, our families loaded up on debt, and our governments loaded up on debt. If we just look at the federal government, and please don't take this as a partisan statement, I know the debt and deficits have risen a lot. Under President Biden, um, if that's a talking point for you, uh, shame on you. Go back and look. They rose under Donald Trump. They rose under Barack Obama. They rose under George W. Bush. Rising deficits, rising debt has been a bipartisan endeavor, a bipartisan undertaking. But if we look at where we sit now, um, we have like $34 trillion in federal debt. About 20 trillion of that is going to roll over in the next 12 months. In other words, the federal government is going out to uh, sell debt into the marketplace um, to the tune of $20 trillion over the next year. If there aren't $20 trillion of buyers, if there aren't people willing to buy the debt uh, and at, at whatever interest rate the government is offering, there's only one thing that can happen. The interest rates have to go up, right? If there's not enough purchasers of this debt, the interest rates have to go up dramatically. And the more the interest rates go up for the federal government, the more interest is paid on the debt, uh, the more deficits will increase, the more has to be borrowed, and it's kind of this upward spiral. The other part of, of course, the federal government sucking up all of the cash in the economy by paying higher interest rates is that everybody else pays higher interest rates too. And having not enough people in a position to lend money 
compared to what actually needs to be borrowed means that money that would normally go to work within the economy is now sucked up in a sense, paying interest on federal debt on past expenditures. Um, this is the crowding out effect that is often talked about and spoken about. Um, in terms of strong towns, the things that we care about, infrastructure, uh, maintenance, um, housing affordability, um, you know, tamping down on the, the crazy number of highways that we're building and expanding. Um, these things are all things that will be dramatically impacted positively and negatively by rising interest rates. Um, there's no kind of clear cut, like a low interest rate is good. A high interest rate is good. I think what we should be seeking more than anything else is an equilibrium interest rate, right? One that isn't distorted, one that actually does reflect this time value of money, this equilibrium between supply and demand of cash. Because if there's one thing that we talk about kind of endlessly at Strong Towns, it's needing good local bottom-up feedback loops. And if capital is super, super cheap for people who are big players who can get, uh, you know, a hundred million dollars easier than you can get a hundred thousand, um, those players will tend to dominate the market. And that is the reality that we've had over the last couple of decades. Restoring capital locally is going to mean higher interest rates. It's also going to mean more responsive local markets. And in the end of the day, that feels like a net positive, even though the transition to that, um, is by necessity, uh, because of, you know, the decisions we've made, particularly over the last two or three decades, going to be very, very likely be very, very painful. We will see. Um, if you have long-term debt in a mortgage, um, that is at a low interest rate, you're likely to not be very mobile right now. Um, if you have a long-term uh, lending that you have done at a low interest rate, you're likely to be very frustrated because your cost of capital is going to be much, much higher. Um, there's a lot of fragile banks out there because of that exact scenario. So we'll see how this plays out. Keep your eye on it. But you'll notice that the Federal Reserve is not likely to increase interest rates um, in the near future. They don't have to. There's just not enough liquidity out there uh, to keep interest rates down. Um, there is a lack of money in the system. And let me put this another way. There was an excessive amount of money in the system for the last two decades. There is not an excessive amount of money in the system right now today. And so you're seeing interest rates rise even when the Federal Reserve has nothing to do with it.